and gentlemen. You might have heard about this funny little game called Deep Rock Galactic, but it's the one and only fun type game in an ever growing sea of life service misery. If the cascade of popular YouTube personalities praising this game wasn't enough to convince you to play, then I will be the last line of defense. A washed up DVD YouTuber, in case you're wondering what my standards look like. Or maybe you're a DRG veteran already, and you're on a YouTube binge of Deep Rock intro videos for that juicy validation dopamine. In which case, yeah, I mean, I do the same, so I can't really judge. So what is Deep Rock Galactic? Dirge is a co-op horde shooter where you play as one of four maniacal space dwarves in service to a questionable mining company somewhere in outer space. It's your job to keep up the sacred corporate tradition of US militarying the bulls out of an alien planet, all while replicating enough violent and xenophobic tendencies to compete with the average space marine. Are we the baddies? No, David Mitchell, we are not the baddies. We desperately need those rocks and stones, and there's only one way to get them. With the help of a mule to do the heavy lifting, some of your time will be spent hacking away at mineral veins during missions. Most of it is probably going to be nitra, a resource vital to keep your ammo stocks at full. Other rocks are there as mission objectives themselves, or currency for upgrading all the fancy weapons this game offers. For a start, we're going to have a look at the fancy dwarves, mostly because going through weapon upgrades and eventually overclocks would take 17 years off my lifespan. Having a balanced dwarven team isn't needed at all, but it is a matter of convenience. So if you go in as four gunners for example, then your mobility is going to be quite scuffed. As it stands, your best option for mobility is the scout. I'm a god boy. I think most people can agree that grappling hooks are a fun mechanic, and you'd think scout's utility allows him to completely avoid full damage, but a lot of the time his oh. gameplay still looks like an ankle fracture any percent speedrun, at least on my end, maybe I'm just bad. No matter how fast you are, above all, the scout must avoid two things. Full damage, and overused driller jokes. And I, I suppose creepy crawlies, but then again, creepy crawlies don't scream at you for missing 0.1 grams on a nitro vein. They just scream because you're using a plasma rifle to dissolve their legs off. Like many horde shooters, there's usually so many enemies that you don't need to see what you're shooting, although a fair few creatures of Hoxies have been blessed with the gift of bioluminescence to make the trip to Insectoid Valhalla that little bit faster. Nonetheless, Scout's last utility is a handy way to show your teammates how many pixels of life-saving minerals you've missed around the cave. Yes, it is a bit like showing your parents around your post-puberty bedroom with a blacklight, but unlike your parents, your fellow dwarves will thank Carl for the additional brightness. Moving onwards to our second TF2 class guide, the Engineer. Deep Rock's engineer can't pop down supportive buildings that pump ammo and health directly into your organs, but he does dispense an alarming amount of death and destruction. And that's because helping your fellow miners in any way that doesn't involve blowing the head off the nearest insect wouldn't be thematically appropriate for this game. He can, however, place mobility enhancing platforms and one or two turrets, depending on how much ammo you want to throw at these poor critters. If you aren't busy trying to recreate some kind of deranged Minecraft parkour map with your cheese gun, then you've got plenty of time to put these down before the angry British man shouts in your ear. Up. Lastly, all your turret eliminations go towards your kill count, so you can act like you did more than your teammates if you want to feel good about yourself. I'm better. I am better. Gunner is going to be a bit more tricky for me to explain since I haven't played him much, but he is also arguably the most basic dwarf available since his specialty is just good sound design. Gunner's shield is an amazing tool for a clutch revive or cheeky ammo restock during the thick of things. Now I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Taking two ammo resupplies is often seen as taboo and quite naughty. However, if they didn't want you taking two resupplies, then they would have made the shield duration shorter. Think about it. Many things in life can take what feels like an eternity to endure. Which brings us to our next contraption, this horrible little thing. It's easy to forget that it's more of a team-oriented utility item than Scout's grapple, or the fact that you can shoot while remaining untouchable to many enemy types while attached. The zipline launcher is still the slowest traversal tool on Hoxies. Luckily, you don't have to think about it too much. In fact, you won't have to think about it at all as long as the sound of exploding bugs fill your eardrums. Driller is the king of unconventional weaponry, mechanics, and morals. It's in the name. He's got a big pair of drills that you can use to mould the map with the guidance of whatever insane YouTube driller tutorial you've watched recently. That includes making bunkers to hold off swarms, or a lifesteal build where you Walt Disneyfy your enemies before churning them into tiny pieces. Having a driller around can be the difference between a most stressful extraction of your tiny dwarven life or a walk in the park. Objectives can also be accessed more efficiently, so despite the constant anxiety of having a bloke with a pack of explosives ready to blow at any moment, driller makes up for it by making missions all the easier. You won't be piercing the heavens anytime soon, but it doesn't matter because generally the objective of this game is going in the opposite direction. Well, this sucks. It wouldn't hurt to talk about the objectives since things can get a tad more complicated than mine rock, put rock in mule, 
Repeat. Before you commit 20 minutes of unwarranted Griffith annihilation, you'll be placed ass down on the space rig. The rig is a very nicely crafted piece of interactive hub goodness, filled to the brim with wacky activities and upgrade stations. The intention here is to occupy you until you forget that 2 hours is the limit for refundable playtime on Steam. The most important part of the space rig, apart from getting groggy and passing out on the dance floor, is the mission selection terminal. There's a number of mission types and modifiers to choose from which you unlock pretty quickly. We'll try to cover some of these missions now. You'll first be sentenced to a life in the mines by management, where you'll pick up some more kite here and there. It's probably the simplest objective to be tasked with, and there's not much to say about it apart from check those walls, or be prepared to backpedal more than J.K. Rowling has retconned her own franchise. The dwarves have got to have some kind of sustenance to keep mining. Corporate beer mixed with explosive powder isn't exactly one of your five a day, so you have the option of going on an egg hunt. Look for the glowing blobs and hack away to find a 2B omelet. Um, thank you. Bloody delicious. Just try to ignore the sounds of a griffed mother out there losing one of its kids to your lunch plan. Getting a bit more complex now are the on-site refinery missions. Firstly, you'll have to find three liquid morkite sites so you can pump the stuff back to the refinery. This requires you to link up all the morkite sites with pipelines which are rideable. The boys back in the deep rock offices would probably have you make an efficient pathway to each pump jack. What management failed to consider, however, is that we dwarves have an innate urge to build a big fuck-off roller coaster wherever we go. It's why I'd stick refining somewhere in the top three for most fun game modes, which is objectively where it should be, unless you don't have the time to build the equivalent of Paltons Park in half an hour. If or when you fail a mission, instead of dying you are rescued and sent to the med bay on the space rig. Salvage operation has you finding bits and bobs of machinery from a team of dwarves who are not so lucky. You'll see beeping mini mules scattered around the cave which require you to find their legs and put them together in one piece. Mission control will then ask you to migrate to a lost drop pod where you need to defend an uplink and a fuel pod so they can send you back home, or rather the cold unforgiving confines of a spacefaring mining station. Earlier I said something about objective simplicity. Point extraction is a definitive get rock and get out game mode, but there are some nuances to it that you might have to look out for. A large station where you can deposit your egg quarks will spawn somewhere in the map, covered head to toe in deadly defensive sentries. Kidding of course, there's, there's, there's only three. They can easily run out of ammo on the higher difficulties because of the sheer amount of bugs to shoot, and swarms will just increase in number the longer you stay. It's sort of a soft time limit, which can take a good chunk out of your nitro supply, or your hairy little dwarven toes. Coming up on the final three objectives that you unlock, a squad duty has you guard a huge dildozer which pilots automatically towards an Omeran hearthstone. We don't really know why, we just know it's an oversized pebble with a lot of worth to our corporate overlords. The dozer itself is affectionately named Doretta, with a patable head on top as a kind of stress ball for when 10 million bucks pop out the ground. Doretta is a wonderful robot, but if the dozer even takes 1% damage, then it'll let loose a scream invoking more PTSD than a former McDonald's employee hearing a fire alarm. On your way to the Hearthstone, you'll have to refill the dozer once in a while with oil shell found wherever the drill dozer gave up. I don't think I mentioned that caves are generated randomly. It's a good time to mention it because that means oil shells are too. They can spawn two feet away from the dozer or a good five miles strut away, so get hiking. After the drill starts feeling better about itself, it'll make its way towards the final phase of the mission, where you'll be mercilessly destroying a sentient rock. A few swarms will appear periodically while you do battle, and on top of that, the rock will start throwing other rocks at Doretta. Phase 4 can get a bit hairy with laser beams bearing down on the drill. If the drill dozer dies, you fail the mission, over, unless you let your driller off the leash to go cut the spiky bits down. Or you can just use any weapon that can destroy terrain, but honestly, Bugs Life visual made me giggle so ho hum. At the end, the rock will explode violently and wipe out any bugs still alive, at which point you can finally grab the slab of almost molten rock with your bare hands and run away back to the drop pod. The biggest and baddest enemies on the planet are called Dreadnoughts. Apart from having a banger OST, they live peacefully inside cocoons until the dwarves poke it with a big stick. All you have to do is eliminate a couple and you're done. And that's it, it's actually kind of easy. Lastly, Sabo. At first, I didn't want to talk about industrial sabotage because I played it around two times and they were both without consent. I'll try to sum it up in a way that makes me sound like I know what I'm talking about. In order to fight the big angry triangle, you need to disable its shields. This can be done by following the wires until you make your way to two different power stations. Both can be hacked to unleash the geometric beast within. It is a bit like a raid boss where you have to understand a bit of what is going on to not get chomped. The caretaker has a few phases, but nothing egregious, apart from the amount of visual fuckery each one produces. After you beat this thing, you get a nice little top animation packaged with some beautiful sound design that almost makes the retinal damage worth it. And that's the objectives covered. Secondary objectives are also a thing if you'd like to bolster your dwarven wealth, but they aren't mandatory. And seeing as one of the secondary objectives is to collect cavern testicles, I don't think they should be. There's also a ton of range in the mutators available, from your bug murdering karmic debt slowly crawling towards you forever, or just free money. For players looking to spice things up a bit, choosing a mission with modifiers is a step in the right direction. Since there are around 20 of them, I don't think I'll be going into detail anytime soon, but I can safely say that the majority of modifiers are a good time. 
the caves of Hoxies are dangerous on their own, and it doesn't help that they're filled to the brim with an assortment of dwarf munching monsters. Most of these come in the form of oversized spider-like creatures called griffins. There are also robotic enemies, but I honestly don't think that the dwarves can tell the difference. What is that there? What is that? Looking things up, I'm realizing that I don't know what half these buggers are even called, which is fine because every player or group has their own goofy name allocated for each of the bugs anyway. Nonetheless, it wouldn't hurt to know what you're up against, since there's more than just griffins out there. Um, and there are so many of them. Uh, do you think Margaret Thatcher had girl power? This guest is terrible. Like I mentioned, griffins are the most common enemy you'll encounter. The grunts aren't very dangerous on their own, which is why they tend to come in waves, which doesn't change the fact that they're usually the first thing that will come into contact with your overclocked microwave. Griffid guards are tankier, more resistant to microwaves, but less will spawn. Shooting them head-on will usually result in piss poor damage, but the dwarves are equipped with plenty of ways to take down tankier enemies anyway. The most deadly of the basic grunt types are exploders and slashers. Exploders have only one aspiration in life, to die comically, as long as you have enough mods installed. No amount of mods will save you from the emotional damage of losing your entire health bar if one of these lads connects though, but it's best to witness these funny sounds from afar. Honestly, slashes are just grunts on roids. They have more health, more damage, they're more attractive. Seriously? Some griffids hit that genetic glossary and grow into more powerful enemies whose presence requires a more tactical approach, and again, there's nothing lucky about what the dwarves are going to commit to your soft fleshy behind once it jiggles into view. A fun little thing that can happen is the spawning of a bulk detonator. Incredibly tanky, can one-shot you, all that fun stuff. After you deplete its health bar, you could admire the light show from a distance. If you get caught up and can't escape in time, it's advised to at least give a hearty rock and stone before you die. The last major Griffin player is a creature called the Griffin Menace. Fighting a menace is a bit like playing whack-a-mole with a Lovecraftian murder bug. In fact, it's, it's exactly like doing that. It has a habit of tunneling away the moment you fire another round of your precious ammo at the wall, and will quickly relocate from another angle. Terrors make up the second most common baddies on Hoxies. Unfortunately, they don't break the stereotype of flying enemies being super annoying. Unlike most other games though, the RG lets you quite literally nuke things out of the air. Apart from barraging you with ranged attacks, the Mactera have a heart palpitation inducing ambush type enemy called the Grabber, which I'm sure you've seen in other DRG related content. They make a quite distinct sound and can be beaten back if you catch them creeping up on you in time. Me, you really got some birds up there? Yeah. One small tidbit about McTerras in general is that they can just appear out of thin air. So if you turn around with three Trijaws in your face, then you probably pissed off the AI director somehow. I'd call the rest of the enemies a jumble of messed up alien evolution, from heat-seeking vines to big saps that spawn tiny griffiths until you destroy them, or a flying version that spawns even more annoying kamikaze flying brains. Smash. But why? There is, however, a silver lining on Hoxies, in the form of the passive loot bug. You drop nitro and gold if you take them out, which for the average person would pose quite the moral dilemma. Not for the dwarves though. After fighting off endless hordes of these guys, drinking way too much beer, and escaping enough missions, you might be able to promote a dwarf or two. Promoting a dwarf is your first step to reaching the end game, where you'll get access to more war crimes than usual, a new mission style, and a new religion so you can pray for the upgrade you've wanted for 200 hours. After promoting, you'll be able to commit a couple of minutes of your life to deep dives, a triple mission length game mode that, at the end of each one, give you certain rewards. Deep dives are there to shatter the illusion that the depths of the kind hold some people you thought they were, because they built a system that lets swarm again and lethal enemies generate randomly into the weekly dive. So, why go through this 50-50 coin flip on reset Thursdays to see whether you'll be fighting the equivalent of a Tyranid invasion or not? How much is this? This is not a gift shop. I've got 50p. Fuck you, bastard. Overclocks are the bread and butter of most meta or even just straight up silly weapon builds. Dives are a surefire way to fight them, but since they are RNG as to which one you receive, your beard can turn from green to grey in the time it takes to get the one you want. Hey! While it is true that farming for overclocks is the majority of the endgame, if you survive the gameplay loop for this long, you're probably already quite the fan of this package anyway. It can sound a bit underwhelming to a new player, but I'm not accounting for all the batshit stuff that we have access to, like perks, machine events, seasonal stuff, the insane modding community, <laughs> and creature encounters, which can all meld together with mutators and environment types for a thoroughly unique experience. With season 4 around the corner, it's a great time to get into the game or pick it back up. If me reading down a wiki page with a few jokes splattered here and there hasn't convinced you, then that's fine. I mean, I hope you at least enjoyed the video. I'll see you next time where I try and get more people to play my latest addiction. Cheers for watching.
Ha 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 ha!